But anyway, praise the Lord. Hopefully, uh, uh, God's blessing in every way, and I, I trust that He is. We obviously uh, were in a series on uh, on our our hurt locker and all of that when we when we went into all this uh, isolation and quarantine and so forth. And we'll get back to that, you guys, when when we are able to be together. We'll get back to that series. I think it'll be a tremendous blessing to you. And I believe God has a word uh, for you in that. And in the meantime, I know that as we're, you know, we're just going out over the internet, that it it is different. Uh, I mean, we can't pretend that it's the same, but hopefully uh, God can speak to our hearts and, and things can really uh, help us and things can be a blessing to you. And as I go through uh, some messages, I believe the, the Lord has given me concerning uh, what we need to be focused on at this time and, uh, and and how God can bless our life and how God wants to move in our life. Now, I started last week on a message on winning the battle of your mind. And I want to just kind of hit back just really brief, very briefly, and, and remind you that there were three truths in that message. All of us do battle... Uh, enemy, the enemy in our life. We, we have, we all have issues. We all have times and, and we all have ways that the enemy attacks us, but the enemy attacks us uh, in order to keep us from accomplishing God's purpose and, and being able to do what God has called us to do. And, and so I was sharing with you that God wants us to be successful in overcoming the devil in every way and he's given us the weapons to be able to do that. And I have w- reminded you last week, or shared with you last week, uh, a couple of a couple of truths concerning this battle of our mind. And uh, and then today I have one last, and it's really how you put this thing in practice. But you'll remember uh, the first thing, that, the first truth that I mentioned to you that your mind is the battlefield between good and evil. That there is a battlefield, and the battlefield is is right here. And reminds you, and this is really appropriate considering that next Sunday's Easter, that Jesus was crucified on Golgotha. And the Bible tells us that Golgotha means the, uh, the place of the skull. In other words, Jesus was crucified on a hill that looked like a human skull. Now, there are many hills in Jerusalem, and Jesus could have been crucified on any of those hills. But he was crucified on a hill that looked like a human skull. And I'm just saying God never misses a trick. I, I mean, God is, <laughs> God is so intricate in everything he does uh, that as those that looked at Jesus on the hill being crucified, they were reminded that Jesus came to heal the way we think and to guard the way we think and to uh, show us how to fight the real battle that we face with the enemy. And I'll just remind you that Jesus fought the battle with the enemy and the battle that Jesus fought was not with, with, with bombs and guns and weapons and bullets and all of that. The battle that Jesus fought with the devil in Matthew 4, if you want to read it, uh, it was, was with words, the ultimate weapon, with words. And Satan was speaking to Jesus uh, half-truths and lies about uh, what God said and what he could do and encouraging him to, uh, to rebel against the Father. And it was all, it was word, it was right here. And Jesus just basically fought him with it is written. But, but, but the battlefield, the battlefield that we face is right here in our mind. And I wanna, I'm going to read a passage. Uh, well, I, I thought I was, but is it, is it up there? There it is. Yeah, there we go. All right. This is from last week, 2 Corinthians 10. Look at what it says, for though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And this is just telling us we fight a spiritual battle. It's not a battle of flesh and blood. It's a battle of uh, in, in the spirit realm. It's a battle all around us. And that God has given us the ability to win this war, to pull down the strongholds that Satan would place in our mind, to cast down the arguments that he always comes against the Word of God with, and to bring every thought that we have into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Because if you don't bring that thought into captivity, it's going to take you into captivity. And so this is the first truth that the battle's in our mind. The second truth is, remember, the Word of God is our weapon. Now, this is really easy to see from the book of Ephesians. It really just says this straight out. 
in Ephesians chapter 6, the Lord teaches us that uh, he has given us weapons and that what we're to do each day is we're to put on the whole armor of God. And I know you're very familiar with that passage. But put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And then he starts telling us all of the weapons that we are to put on. We're to put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, we're to put on the girdle of truth, that, that belt where the sword hangs, the girdle of truth around our waist, have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. And then he tells, now, before you leave, you need to pick up two, two weapons, one in each hand. One is a defensive weapon, and it's called the shield of faith with which we quench the fiery darts, the fiery thoughts, the missiles that Satan fires at our mind and our heart every day. And then we're to pick up the sword of the Spirit with the other hand, which is identified in Ephesians 6 as the Word of God, and that we're to face the enemy with these things. And so the, the, we face battles. The battles are in our minds. This is the warfare. This is the battlefield. This is what the devil is, is, is fighting for, to put strongholds and arguments in high places and to distract us and to take our attention away from anything that would bring us closer to the Lord and distract us away so that he can win the battle and we will not accomplish the purposes of God. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what kind of, what kind of a battle it is. It could be depression. It could be, uh, you know, anger, hostility, unforgiveness. It could be a critical spirit. It could be lust. It could be uh, any, any stronghold that he might have. He doesn't care what it is, just so it keeps us from, from making our way to Christ and paying attention to Christ and receiving all of the things that, that Jesus has for the purpose of our life. So those are two truths. And here's the third one. And this is the way that we put uh, into practice our weapon that God has given us, our only offensive weapon. All of the weapons in Ephesians 6 are defensive weapons, a helmet, a breastplate, uh, a girdle of truth, uh, shoes of the gospel, and a shield of faith. All of those are defensive weapons, and they're, it's wonderful to have defensive weapons, and everybody needs to protect themselves. But nobody ever wins a battle with only defensive weapons. You have to go on offense sometimes. And God says, I'm going to give you an offensive weapon that is powerful enough to pull down those strongholds, to cast down those arguments, and to, and to pull down every high place that Satan would set up in your mind so that you won't obey Christ. And that one weapon is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we have that one offensive weapon, and the Lord says, now, you're going to have to go on offense sometime because you can't just play defense. So let me share with you how to go on offense and the way to put the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, into operation so that you can win the battle. And this would be truth number three. And truth number three is meditating on the Word of God puts the sword of the Spirit into operation. Now, when I use that word meditate, I need to identify it the way the Bible uses it because it does use it quite a few times. It, it actually tells us to meditate day and night and, and so forth. And it uses the word but uh, the word's kind of been hijacked in, in, in these modern times by Eastern religions and the New Age movement and things like that, where they mean by meditating, uh, they mean that you uh, focus on yourself and that you uh, also call into play some, some kind of deity. It could be one of thousands. I mean, it doesn't matter to them, and, and call them into operation. But when the Bible talks about meditating, what the Bible is talking about, there are two definitions, and I, I want to just hit these real quickly because they, they both are really come into play on this. There are two definitions for the way Bible, the Bible uses the word meditate, and one is, uh, the first definition is to consider or ponder. In other words, when we, when we, can, when we, contemplate something, when we roll it around in our mind, when we, when we, when we think of it and we, and we, uh, and we ponder and we, we, we're, we're, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're focusing on it and letting it speak to our hearts and we're rolling it around in our mind and our thoughts. That, that's one definition of meditate. And then the other definition of meditate is 
to speak or to uh, mumble to oneself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you have you ever have you ever been doing something and then you just you start talk, you're just talking to yourself. You're just mumbling something to yourself or muttering something to yourself. I've had folks, uh, and the older I get, uh, the the more I do this, I understand <laughs> that I that I I I I do this all the time and and. Uh, and I might be working on something, and 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 uh, Pastor Tanya say, "Are you talking to me?" You know, <laughs> I'm not really aware that I'm really speaking out loud. And I've had folks that I've worked with. I've worked in secular jobs a lot uh, in these last years, and uh, and I'm I'm serious. They'll they'll be they'll just kind of walk away chuckling because they'll hear me say something, and I'll be talking to myself. Well, well, to mutter or to speak to yourself. Uh, with some scripture, with some word, with some praise, or with some uh, something that God's put in you, or that you've read, and now you've, you're pondering it, you're rolling around, you're contemplating it in your in your heart and in your head, and uh, and you and you begin to mutter and you begin to mumble and speak a few things. Well, that's that is that's the the definition. That's the biblical definition of the word meditate. So meditating on the word of God is what puts the sword of the Spirit into operation. You know, you can't, you can't stab the devil, right, because you can't see him. You can't shoot him, right, because you can't see him. No, you can't hit him because you can't see him. It's, a, it's an invisible foe. It's, a, it's an enemy that uh, fights in a spirit realm. Well, in order to fight in a spirit realm, you've got to show up for battle. And, and God gives you an offensive weapon to show up to battle with. You know, before the Satan can take advantage of us, he's got to disarm us. And he can disarm us by removing the sword of the Spirit. This is an important issue in our life. This is a battle. This is a weapon that God gives us to fight with. And we all have areas in our life where we fight spiritual battles. It might be fear or depression or discouragement or low self-esteem or greed or anger or all those kind of things. But when we meditate on the Word of God, what we're doing is we're bringing the Word of God into our hearts and mind, and we're letting the Word of God do what the Word of God does in us. It, it renews, it transforms our mind. Uh, I know some of you are already quoting the Scripture from Romans 12. Here it is. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Look at verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. Don't be pressed into the mold. That's what conform means. It means this world presses you into a mold. So don't be pressed in the, in, in, into a mold. Don't follow the diagram of the earth, uh, of the people of the world, and be just like them, but be transformed. That's the Greek word metamorpheu, which means to be totally changed, but in, like a butterfly in a caterpillar. You know, a caterpillar goes into the uh, cocoon, and when he comes out, he's a butterfly. Doesn't look anything like he did when he went in. Doesn't act anything like he did when he went in. Uh, doesn't function like he did when he went in. He is totally transformed. Well, what is Romans saying? Paul is saying that our minds can be totally transformed when they are renewed that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, so the, it is the Word of God that transforms our mind. It, it's the Word of God that changes the way we think. And that's where the battle is fought. And, and, and so we're to let the Word of God, we, we take in the Word of God, and the Word of God begins to, change, begins to do what only it can do, and that is to renew and change and transform our mind. One of the scriptures I love in connection with the Word of God and, and meditating on it and so forth, and you probably are already ahead of me, is Psalms chapter 1. And the first three verses, I know some of you can probably even quote this, but let me, let me just read it and, and, and show you what it says. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Everybody say the Word of God. Yeah. Remember, this is an Old Testament passage, and all of the Word of God when this was written was the law. This is what God spoke. And so his delight is in the Word of God, the law of the Lord, and in his law, look, he meditates day and night. Now, I know that many people think, well, I can't meditate all day. And, 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 and many times objections happen 
uh, to this concept of meditating on the Word of God because you're thinking you can't do it. You're thinking, man, nobody could take all day and night. Well, well I, I'm going to show you what that really means, what day and night really means. And, and, um, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll find it uh, helpful, and, and you can do this, and this can be accomplished. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be, look, this is the promise. If you will do this, this is what God says will happen to you. You will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Do you see the promise there? The promise is, all right, if you will meditate on the Word of God, if you will ponder the Word, if you will speak the Word, if you will say, well, well as, as a matter of fact, you, you remember what the Scripture tells us in Ephesians. I, I know you've read Ephesians 5. And in Ephesians 5, we usually read the end of it, which talks about husbands love your wives like Christ loved the church, and wives oh, submit yourself to your husband. I mean, we, that's the part of, of Ephesians 5 we usually read. But before you get to that part, Paul is talking to the church, and he's telling the church how to live the Christian life together and how to be the body of Christ. And, and he says this. He says, he, you know, uh, uh, above all else... Uh, Speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. So what, 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 is, what does Paul say in Ephesians? That part of, the, part of the, the, the walk that helps us become the body of Christ and be the body of Christ is that we would speak to each other and we would murmur to each other. We would... We would we would speak to each other in, in psalms. And what are psalms? Psalms are just the Word of God put to music. That's, that's what the book of Psalms is. The book of Psalms in your Bible are hymns or, or songs that Israel sang as it went across the desert. Yeah. And, um, and they put them to music. Now, we've lost the music, but we still have the words. So he says, take the Word of God and, and, and make it into a, into a psalm. And then, and then hymns. What are hymns? Hymns are songs about God and about the way God works and the way God interacts with us. and Anything to do with the purpose and acknowledgement of God is a hymn. And then spiritual songs. What are spiritual songs? Spiritual songs are those songs that the Holy Spirit gives you in your own heart. Spiritual songs are those songs that come out of you, like these praise songs and worship songs, like songs where your relationship with God and your interaction with God, it just brings something out of you. And so, and so what I'm saying is that to meditate means not only to ponder and think about something, but it also means to murmur or speak things. And, and as, a, as part of my meditation, one of the great parts of it is that I can begin to incorporate things like uh, some, some songs, some hymns, some spiritual songs that are in my heart and use that uh, to, uh, to, to meditate, to, to be an enhanced form. And, um, and, and, and notice that the verse says, the last line says that, Whatever you do will prosper. This is talking about a tree that's planted by the river. You know what a tree planted by the river is? It's sufficient. It means it doesn't have to wait for rain because its roots go into the river and its roots are always receiving water. So if you meditate on the Word of God, what, the, what, what God is saying is that you'll be sufficient. It means that you're not going to go up and down. You're not going to go into a drought and lose your leaves and lose your crop, lose your fruit. You're going to be constantly uh, fed by the Spirit of God, and it says that when this happens, your fruit's going to bear in its season, and your leaf is not going to wither, and whatever you do will prosper. What in the world does that mean? Well, that means that not only am I protected by the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, but I am enlightened by the Word of God. The Word of God goes into my mind and does things to my thinking and, my, and, and, and who I am and what I am, and it changes and it enlightens me and it prepares me so that I can be successful in life. Uh, when I begin to meditate on the Word of God, the Word of God not only affects my spiritual life, it affects every other part of my life. You know, this Bible here, this Bible, I, I held it up last week. I said, this Bible is a thick book, and it is a thick book. You know why it's a thick book? Because God has lots to say in it. And what God says in it is everything about life. Everything that God wants us to know about how he operates and how we're to operate is written in his word. How to prosper, how to be effective, how to use it, how to think, how to act, how to be. 
All of that is in the Word of God. And what I'm saying is when we meditate on the Word day and night, we allow the Word of God to go into our mind and, and, and renew our mind and transform our mind and prepare us in every way for, for all of the things that we need in life. Uh, when, I, when, I, when, when I meditate on the Word of God, uh, I'm going to get some information about finances that I need about finances. I'm going to get some information about relationships, about marriage, about child rearing, about how to be a great person, how, what kind of attitude I'm to have. All of those kind of things God tells us in his word. And this verse in Psalms 1 says, if we'll meditate day and night, that God will, will change the way we think so that in everything in life, not just church, not just spirit life, but everything you do will be set in order to be able to prosper because the Word of God is going to change you and prepare you to be successful the way God intends for us to be successful. It's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to read one verse and tomorrow it's going to be that way. It's going to happen over a period of time. And over a period of time, your mind is going to be transformed and your thinking and your behavior is going to become faith-filled. And when your behavior becomes faith-filled, God can prosper you in life. God is not going to honor non-faith actions in our life. When we act out of fear, when we act out of rebellion, when we act out of anything except faith, God is not invited into that activity, and God does not bless that activity. What does, what does Hebrews 11 say? I quoted it a few minutes ago. Hebrews 11 says, without faith, it's highly unlikely that we would please God. It's almost impossible that we would please God. No, it says without faith, it is impossible to please God. So God works in our life by faith, and when we do actions, and when, we, when, 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 our, when our thinking and our, our belief system and our actions and our attitudes and all, are, are directed by faith, then God can get in that, and God can bless that because it's done by faith and not by fear or any other emotion. So I am totally different today as a human being than I was when I first got saved. Not only am I a lot older in life, but I don't think the same way that I used to think before I got saved, before I trusted Christ. God's Word, the sword of the Spirit, the truth, has made me free, has changed my thinking, has blessed my life as I've gone forward. And I'm not 100% perfect, and I know you guys know that, and neither is anybody else in this world. But when I look back at the way I was then, I thank God for what he's done in me now. So hopefully now you at least believe that biblical meditation is something that you should be involved in. That it really is a powerful weapon and it really is what God intends for us to do. Now there are, there, I want to talk to you about the process and I'm going to make it very, very quick, all right? There, I want to, three things first about the process and just, just hit this process real quick. Number one, uh, in order, before you start rolling the Word of God around in your mind, you first of all need to get a Bible that you can read and understand. There are lots of translations of Bibles. I, I, I read the King James Version of the Bible because, I, you know, I'm 64 years old. I was brought up with it, and every scripture I've ever memorized is a King James Version scripture. Well, that speaks to my heart because that's, that's been my life, and I'm trained that way. Many of you, that would not be true. You'd get lost in, in, the, in the flow of the language and all of those kind of things. But there are many there uh, Bible bookstores filled with them. I know you can find them on the Internet, and there are all kinds of versions, translations, and so forth. So you need to get, need to get you a Bible that you can read and understand and then get you a good concordance. A concordance is just a, 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 all the words in the Bible that are listed and then what verse they're mentioned in. And in the back of your Bible, if you have a study Bible, all of that listing back there is a concordance 
Uh, they, young makes a concordance, strong makes a concordance. Uh, the internet is, I'm sure, filled. You could type in the word and you'll find a bunch of things, a lot of free things you can use. And all that means is if you are having trouble with something and you can identify it, like I'm having trouble with fear or anxiety or uh, strife or worldliness or lust or whatever it might be, I can look up that word and it'll tell me every verse in the Bible that that word is used in. And so I get a good Bible I can understand, get a concordance so I can, I can uh, find words that I need. And then remember that, that to meditate not only means to ponder or consider, but it also means to speak to yourself. So, so uh, I, I, I can uh, create things in my mind. I can, I can um, develop tunes. I can do anything that will help me be able to remember what I read. All right. So with all that said, here, here are the three things. Number one, you wake up in the morning and you read what you need. Uh, whatever's bothering you, whatever's going on inside you, what are you struggling with? Now, you don't have to make this, you know, some big uh, spiritual marathon or some religious activity in your life. I mean, just what, what, is, it, what is it that you're struggling with? I mean, are you, are you discouraged? Are you dealing with fear? Are you dealing with anxiety? Are you mad about something or unforgiveness? What is it that's bothering you? So when you, when, you, when you get up, you get up a little bit earlier than normal and you get your scripture and you say, "What, Father, uh, this is bothering me. And then you can look in your concordance or there are lots of books that are made with all kinds of categories and they give you scriptures that go in each category. There are lots of ways that you can find scriptures that have to do with the way that you're feeling and you find one and then you turn to it and you read it and you allow the, the Lord to speak to you and say, Lord, this is my word for today and I'm, I'm reading uh, this verse because I'm having trouble with anger today or I'm extremely anxious or I'm fearful or scared to death or whatever it might be. And Lord, I'm loading this in my mind and I'm loading this scripture in my mind so that your sword, so that the sword of the Spirit can be in my mind and God can, and you can can use this throughout the day in order to uh, to help me. Second, the second uh, principle in this process is throughout the day I bring it up. So I load it in in the morning, and I load in what it is that I'm dealing with, and then the and then I during the day, all through the day I bring it up. I I, I roll it back into my mind and ponder it again. I know the word. Um, uh, does the word ruminate mean anything to you? Uh, to ruminate, ruminate's what a cow does. Uh, I think deer do it and uh, sheep do it, um, uh, antelope do it. Anyway, to ruminate means to bring something back up and chew it again. Uh, you've heard of a cow chewing its could. Well, what a could is is something that it's already eaten, and then it put it in one of those stomachs. It has four of them, I think. Uh, I think it does if biology serves me right. And he puts it, and the cow puts it there, and then the cow brings it back up and chews it some more. And here, here's the truth about it. Uh, every time he chews it, it gets more and more pure. So, hey, think about that. Every time you bring it up and roll it around in your mind, the Word of God gets more and more vital in your life, gets more and more pure in your life. It, 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 it matters more and more. So, anyway, what you do, just like an old cow chewing its good, you, you, you put that Word in your mind in the morning, and you've asked God to bless it, and you're rolling it around, you're pondering it, you're considering it, you're bringing it back up. Now, now all through the day or at any time that you're feeling uh, a little shaky about what it is that's going on in your mind, it could be a story from the Bible. It could be a character in the Bible. There are lots of ways to load your mind with the Word of God. It doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be something religious. Get something that's really bothering you and use that Word of God and put it in there. And then as the Word of God comes up, as that issue comes up through the day, bring up the Word with it. I'm going to share a passage with you. I told you that I was going to mention something to you about this day and night issue, about he that meditates on it, meditate day and night on the Word of God. Here in Deuteronomy chapter 6, of course, this is, uh, this is uh, the Lord speaking to Moses about what the children of Israel are to do. And the, and the Lord says, all right, the children of Israel are to do two things. Here's the first one. In other words, you fathers of Israel, you teach your children two things. Number one, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So God says, all right, Moses, first of all, you need to tell the fathers that the first thing they need to teach their children is to love me more than anything. 
to love me with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their strength. Now, the second thing you need to do, Moses, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house four times. These are the, these are the four areas that are identified when we're to specifically teach our children the Word of God which could translate very easily into making sure that we're meditating on the Word of God ourselves. We've got that Word in us. We've rolled it around. God's been speaking to us with it. But there are four times, obviously, God is saying, there are four times of the day and night in which we're more susceptible than any other time in our life. And these are the four times that we're most susceptible. I mean, think about it. Think about it. You, don't, you, you, you probably don't have problem, a problem with your mind or thinking all the time, right? I mean, when you're doing other things, when you're at work, when you're involved in other activities and so forth, that, that's probably not when you're dealing with, all of, with depression or anxiety or fear or hostility, whatever it might be. But it is these times that he's about to mention to us that, that we have the most problem with the thoughts in our mind. Think about it. All right, here we go. You teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, all right? So when you're sitting around at night in your house, uh, maybe you're not watching TV, you're not doing anything in particular, but you're, you're sitting there and, and that brain's kind of idling along and what starts happening? Well, what starts happening usually is Satan starts bombing you with whatever it is he wants to create in you. So he said, all right, while you're sitting there in your house, teach this. Teach the Word of God. When you walk by the way, that means when you're going somewhere. I mean, how, 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 how much time do you spend in your car? How, how long does it take you to get to work? How long does it take you to get where you're going? Some people, some of you guys probably spend an hour in your car or 30 minutes or 40, whatever it might be. And when you're in there, uh, what's happening? A lot of times you're fantasizing, you're daydreaming, you're what, all those kind of things like that. You're dangerous on the road, by the way. But, but the point is that you have lots of time when you're on your way somewhere. So he said, when you're sitting in your house, when, you, when you're on your way somewhere, and when you lie down, that means when you get in bed at night. When you get in bed at night, what starts happening? Oh, yeah, you start rolling around everything, right? Yeah, you start contemplating, you start thinking, Satan's popping stuff in, Satan's moving in, and, and, and he's trying to counsel you, and he's trying to intimidate you, and he's trying to put things into your mind. That's why the Scripture says don't go to bed angry, because if you go to bed angry, you, you remember what it says, you give a foothold to the devil. Yeah, that's right. He said don't let the sun go down on your wrath, because when you do this, you give a foothold to the devil in your life. That just simply means if you go to bed angry the devil's going to counsel you all night. And he's going to put these things in you and you're going to wake up more upset in the morning than you went to bed. So, when you lie down at night, meditate on the Word of God. Roll it around in you. Bring your could back up and chew on it a little bit more. And when you rise up. So when you get, when you rise up in the morning and you're laying there in bed and you haven't gotten out and you haven't started your day and you're just trying to get yourself together before you can get all yourself out of the bed. And, and if you're older like us, it might take a little bit longer. But, 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 but that's when all right, things pop in your mind in the morning that the devil wants to plague you with all day long. So what I'm saying is, I'm saying that when, the, when, the, when Psalms 1 says meditate and meditate on his law day and night, He's talking about times like these, when you're in your house, when you're going to bed at night, when you're rising up, when you're going along, riding riding along in your automobile. Use those times to meditate on the Word of God and bring it back up. And when you do, God is is going to do surprising things in your life. God is going to speak to you. God is going to remove that temptation. God's going to fight that temptation. And I just want to remind you, remember, to be tempted is not a sin. Anybody can be sent, be tempted, right? I mean, right now, the devil could just pop a thought into my mind that might be a temptation to me, right? Or it might come out of my own heart or my own thoughts. So I can be tempted at any time. But just to be tempted doesn't mean I've sinned. Uh, you've heard the old saying, and I've said it before, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep him from building a nest in your hair. In other words, you can't keep 
a temptation away from you, but you can keep from meditating on that temptation. And when you meditate on the temptation, that's when usually it becomes sin and sin and, and, and sin overtakes your life. All right. So we get the Word of God in us, and then we roll it around throughout the day, throughout the night. We roll it around. We, we let God bring it back up, and, and it gets refined more and more every time we do that. And then here's the third one real quick. Replace lesser thoughts with a greater one. One thing we need to remember, and that is whether the devil puts something in our mind or whether it just comes out of our own heart, you can't take a thought out of your mind. As a matter of fact, the more you try to take a thought out of your mind, the less likely it is that it's going to lead. It's, it just gets worse and worse. An example, yellow elephant, yellow elephant, yellow elephant. Don't think of a yellow elephant. Don't, no, don't see the elephant riding on a little bike in that yellow costume. No, don't think, I see you, you're thinking about a yellow elephant. No, yellow elephant, right, okay. Is that yellow elephant? Can you stop thinking about a yellow elephant? No, most likely not. Red dog, red dog. You like red dogs. You have a red dog laying in your driveway right now. Your favorite dog was an Irish setter, and he's ready. All right, what just happened? Well, you probably quit thinking about a yellow elephant, right? Well, what you did is you replaced one thought with the other. And that's the whole point of the thing. You can't just take things out. You know, a lot of people try by willpower to overcome what what the enemy plants into our mind or what comes out of our own wicked heart. And we try to, and we try to f have extreme willpower and use dynamic discipline to fight against this thing. And, and, and one thing we know for sure is that our willpower is not strong enough to take care of the big things in our life. We prove that to ourselves every year in January when we make dynamic resolutions and in, in 10 days uh, it's gone. Why? Because we didn't have enough discipline. We didn't have enough willpower for it to even last 10 days, much less to be totally eliminated from our mind. So willpower is not going to do it. But see, I don't need willpower because God has given me a tre tremendous asset. And that asset is the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me and what does the Bible say when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of me? He brings with him, Galatians 5, for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, or self-control. That when the Holy Spirit comes to live into me, he brings self-control with him. So what I'm saying to you is, look, instead of trying to use your willpower, which is not going to work, it's like wrapping up, it's like wine in a rubber band. Have you, have you ever done that? Taking a rubber band? Maybe you put a little paper clip in it. You know, you've done this before, right? Like, especially as a child, maybe. And you put a little paper clip, and then you wound it like a, you know, like it's a, like it's a propeller. And, and, and you just kept on winding, winding, winding. You let it go, and then, brrr, and then you do it again. And eventually, you would wind it so tightly that it would snap, right? That's the way willpower is. You can keep winding, 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 but eventually it's going to snap. So what I'm saying is, instead of trying to use your tremendous willpower, which is not going to work, why don't you use what God has given you? God has said, here's what you do. Depend on the Holy Spirit. Now, that just simply means I, I, I say to God, Lord, I need, I need some, need some self-control in, in my life. Lord, put this in my life. Lord, you take this. Give me the ability to remove this thought and, and, and replace it with a, with a greater thought so that I don't have to fight this battle all day long. So that it's not a battle of my will, and it's not a battle where I'm worn out and fatigued from fighting this thing all day. How many of you want to fight battles all day long to, do, to not do something that you really want to do? Isn't that, I mean, that's torture, right? You're going to fight battles all day long to not do what it is that something just popped into your brain, some stronghold, some, to not worry, to not be filled with anxiety, to not be filled with fear. And you're going to fight all day trying not to feel those things. Now, isn't that torturous? Why don't you just ask God, God, change my mind. Change my thoughts about this thing. Put in me a greater thought. Lord, you are, you're the one that brings discipline into my life. You bring goodness. You bring self-control, the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
It's what the Holy Spirit brings when he comes into our life. And then when Satan attacks you, you can fight him with the warfare and the weaponry of God. And those are your weapons. Your mind is the battlefield. The, battle, the Bible is a weapon. And biblical medication is how we win every single battle. We don't let thoughts come into our life that are out of control. As they come into our life, we make them yield to the obedience to Jesus Christ. And God takes every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Yeah, biblical meditation. Yeah, do it. That's, that's the way you put the sword of the Spirit into operation. That's what Jesus did when Satan came to him and said, all of those things, make bread, throw yourself off the temple, these kingdoms. The only, what, what did Jesus say to him? Jesus said, I've already got something loaded in me that's going to defeat you as it is written. And he just quoted the Word of God. Jesus looked at Satan and said, you've already lost. Why? Because it's written. <laughs> And it has been written, and God will, God will bless your life. All right, let me pray with you.